Thanks for joining our Dialing Into Your Best Dairy, a podcast series brought to you by dairy educators with Cornell University. In this series, we'll be walking through a cow's life cycle to pinpoint best management practices to maximize each cow's genetic potential in your herd. Welcome to the next episode of the Cornell Cooperative Extension's Dialing In Your Best Dairy. I'm Margaret Quasdorf, Dairy Management Specialist from the Northwest New York Regional Team, and I'm joined today by Dave Belbian of the Central New York Regional Team. Dairy heifers represent your future herd productivity and success, or if you're a heifer grower, that of a dairy for which you are raising heifers. This episode is going to dial in on raising your heifers to meet their full genetic potential. Dave, the months following weaning is typically a black box of calf and heifer nutritional management. We tend to underfeed our calves in the months post weaning as we assume that their intake of forage is high. Therefore, we sometimes short them on concentrate. Also, total costs range from $1,850 to $2,275 to raise a heifer through to freshening. And this doesn't even include the value of the live heifer calf to, that you start out with. Can you tell us a little more about our goals for our heifers and how we can achieve them? Sure, sure. To me, the goal for feeding dairy replacement heifers should be to grow them so that they are able to reach their maximum genetic potential when they enter the milking herd. Heifers with inadequate growth will either require a longer period of time to achieve breeding weight or will enter the milking herd undersized. Heifers that need more time to reach breeding weight will cost more to raise because of the number of days on feed is so great, even though the average daily feed cost may be less. Heifers entering the milking herd undersized will need to direct more nutrients to growth during the first lactation and will produce significantly less milk than if they were well grown. In fact, a study that was published in the Journal of Dairy Science in 2012 from work that was done at Cornell was actually looking at pre-weaning milk replacer intake and the effects on long-term productivity in dairy calves. However, they followed up and also looked at post-weaning to breeding period. And they found that basically uh, you could pick up an additional about 1,200 pounds of milk in heifers that really gained weight and, and were grown well compared to ones that were not. And actually in the first three lactations, there was about 8,200 pounds of additional milk in heifers that were well grown. It's an important period of time. Uh, heifers need to be ready to be uh, bred at 12 to 14 months of age. And, and again, it depends on the frame size that you have, but typically between 770 and 880 pounds. So they need to achieve an average daily gain of around two pounds per head per day. Two pounds per head per day, average daily gain is a good average. And just like we said, depending on what the mature weight of the cows in your herd are, or perhaps the mature frame size of your cows, your actual farm average daily gain might be different. So a common guideline is for heifers to become pregnant at 55% of their mature weight. For animals with a mature weight of 1,600 pounds, that would mean pregnancy should occur around 880 pounds. And for a 1,800 pound mature weight, pregnancy should occur around 990 pounds. And for a 1,400 pound mature weight, pregnancy should occur around 770 pounds. So the targeted growth needs to be specific to your herd. And to do that, you're gonna need to uh, actually look at the, the size of your mature cows in your herd. So Dave, how do we manage nutrition at each stage to reach our goals? Well, that's, that's really the key. Ration balancing needs to be done with an up-to-date ration balancing program, such as CNCPS by a competent nutritionist. An ongoing monitoring effort needs to be implemented to determine if results are matching the goals set forth. A common mistake with these growing heifers are diets lacking in protein. A high energy diet that lacks sufficient protein will result in heifers that are short in fat. Weight gain may be adequate, but this is not the kind of heifer we want. As energy content in the diet is increasing to achieve the desired weight gain, protein in the diet needs to be increased as well. This will give us heifers with adequate stature and skeletal development rather than short fat heifers. Several agribusiness firms and universities publish guidelines for dairy replacements that people can use to monitor their progress. One big problem we have is that we lack data on body weight and average daily gain on the majority of our herds. I believe that systems such as scales to weigh heifers are a great opportunity area on many of our farms. Weight tapes can be used, but they are labor intensive 
and not always as accurate as we would hope. As Alicia mentioned in the last podcast covering birth through weaning, these calves should be weaned gradually over a two-week period of time to avoid the growth slump that is too common on many farms. You should also avoid stressors such as vaccinating, regrouping, and a change in starter grain all at the same time. Calves at two months of age can be fed a dry TMR that contains a chopped dry forage such as dry hay chopped about one inch in length. About 85% of the diet should come from a concentrate feed. Be sure it's well mixed to avoid sorting. Be sure the feed is always available or pushed up to avoid slug feeding. This is not the kind of behavior we want to instill in these animals at a young age that they'll likely carry on as they uh, become cows in the milking herd, and we know the kind of problems that can cause. Average daily gain should be around 2.5 pounds per head per day during this period, and the protein level in the total diet probably is gonna need to be somewhere in the 18 to 20% range. Calves from four to six months of age can start to transition to a higher forage diet, and can be introduced to fermented feed. However, the fermented feed should not make up the majority of the diet. Rate of gain should be around two and a quarter pounds per head per day, and the diet containing in the range of 15 to 16 percent crude protein. By six months of age, fermented feeds can make up the majority of the diet. Grain rates can be reduced as long as the forage is of high quality, and that's the key. Typical rates of gain are around two pounds per head per day, up until breeding are, are what we're usually shooting for. And the total protein in the diet will generally be in the 15 to 16% range. From breeding until calving, a diet containing mostly forage can achieve the desired growth rate of about 1.75 pounds per day if the forage is high enough quality. Be sure the rations are properly balanced and the growth rates are monitored. Most people consider this period as the cheap or low cost feed period because little grain is typically needed. As these animals increase in size, their dry matter intake increases and daily feed cost actually goes up because they eat so much. We should be targeting a body condition score of three and a quarter to 3.5 for these animals. Overconditioned animals will result in greater calving difficulties, which we want to avoid. Protein levels in these diets are gonna be in the 13 and a half to 14% range. Now, some people question the use of ionophores. They enhance average daily gain because they improve absorption of nutrients by inhibiting the growth of coccidia. In calves, ionophores can reduce the time it takes a heifer to reach calving weight by about three weeks. Their use is fairly easy to justify. Nutritional needs grow greatly in the last three weeks before freshening. This is due to the development and growth of the mammary system, uh, the nutritional requirements of the growing calf, and the nutritional requirements for milk production. Heifers should be fed a pre-fresh diet for three to four weeks pre-calving. These animals are often grouped with pre-fresh cows. If you have a herd size that allows you and you have the ability to segregate first calf heifers uh, in the milking herd, you may also find it advantageous to separate these animals pre-calving. Thanks, Dave. How about housing? What are the things we need to consider there? Well, when it comes to housing, I usually think of two different situations when it comes to our heifers. Oftentimes, we're dealing with older buildings, old barns that need to be repurposed or remodeled. There's an initial capital investment there, but these buildings may have some limitations and drawbacks uh, that often can be kind of worked around if we're smart about it. Uh, and the other situation is new barns that are built specifically for heifers. There's a lot more options with a brand new building when you're starting with a clean slate. We need to group heifers by size, not age. We need to scale the stalls, headlocks, and crossovers to the heifer size. We need to be sure feeding areas are large enough. As an example, three to four month olds need 12 inches of bunk space, but a 12 to 24 month old needs 22 inches. Inadequate feed bunk space results in greater aggression and competition which can lead to injury, the younger, more timid calves falling behind. Also, keeping feed pushed up is important for heifers too. Hoof trimmers have noted heifers entering the milking herd with hoof and leg conformation issues due to heifers straining and pushing against the bunk to reach feed. Growing bones can be altered in this way and can affect longevity of the animal in the herd. We need to be sure we match stall sizes to group sizes. As an example, a 300 pound heifer needs a 30 inch wide stall, 
an 1100 pound heifer needs a 42 inch wide stall. You can refer to the Dairy Calf and Heifer Association Gold Standards Guidelines for further dimension recommendations. Lots of great details there that you can, uh, you can take a look at as you're looking at remodeling or building a new facility. Also think about lighting. It's important for heifers as well as milking cows. Long day lighting has shown to increase growth rates and feed intake in heifers. Also, I know, and I know it's tempting, do not overcrowd. They should not have to choose between lying on the floor or standing because there are no open stalls available. Environmental pathogens are our biggest culprit in mastitis in fresh first calf heifers. It's important to consider feasibility and scheduling of cleaning up facilities that house our heifers to allow her to take off without a hitch when she enters the milking strain. Heel warts often begin in dirty heifer pens and can get increasingly worse and negatively affect cow throughout her lifetime. Prevention is key by keeping the floors clean and removing hazards that may cause injury to hoofs and skin. Put in foot baths, logical locations are in cross over alleys where animals can be forced to go through them. Include plenty of crossovers. For every 100 feet of alley, there should be a minimum of three crossovers and do not create dead end alleys. Pay attention to the floors. Uh, roughness will cause foot damage. Grooving after the concrete hardens is really the preferred method to, uh, to handle these, these concrete floors. Assess barn orientation in your decision making. The long side of a barn facing prevailing winds will aid in natural ventilation, but may not give you as much beneficial effect with a two or three row barn. Sidewall heights impact natural ventilation. In new construction, aim for a minimum of 12 to 14 feet. A higher pitch roof also helps. A four to 12 pitch is desirable. It helps to get that natural ventilation uh, moving up to the ridge and uh, get that warm air out of the building. Great. So Dave, according to the National Animal Health Monitoring data, the most treated disease in weaned heifers is respiratory illness. Damaged lungs and poor growth rates at this time can really ruin a heifer's potential for succeeding in the milking strain. Can you talk to us about proper ventilation in heifer barns? Sure, sure. Ventilation is really key. It's, uh, it's, it shouldn't be and it's not as much of a challenge as it is in our lactating cow barns as those cows produce a lot more body heat. But ventilation removes and replaces contaminated air with fresh air. Uh, and that's what we're really looking for, not only for the animals, but for the people. We also need to think about heat stress abatement, alleviating the negative effects of overheating. Uh, dairy replacement can handle cold pretty well as long as they are clean and dry and are not exposed to drafts in the wintertime. Heat stress is really our biggest challenge. In the summer, we want to limit radiant heat gain by reducing sun exposure. Our barns do that. Insulated barns reduce radiant heat load in the animal area, but that kind of investment is only typically made in lactating cow barns. You may have a situation where a cow barn that was insulated was converted to a heifer barn and that can give you some additional advantage uh, on some really hot sunny days. Hot air rises as it does in the chimney. Uh, in our freestall barns, we can use that to our advantage by using natural ventilation to bring fresh air in from open sidewalls and exiting it through an open ridge. Even in the winter, we need to do this in a minimal fashion to provide some ventilation. Also think about fans. Axial of fans can help supplement air exchange, direct airflow to match up to the natural outside air movement, but parallel to the feeding area and stall rows. Think about the quality of fans, be sure they have shrouds, guards, and think about the material that the blades are made of. I've seen some really inexpensive fans that had no shroud, the blades were made out of paper thin uh, aluminum that after a couple years, uh, they basically they straightened out and they weren't doing the job that they were designed to do. Uh, make sure you mount them high enough to avoid interference with equipment. Uh, and also remember that these uh, overhead fans that are high volume, low speed, blowing directly downward, they don't really help with air exchange. They only stir the air, which in a confined place or an area, a specialized area where we can't get good air movement, uh, they can be beneficial, but they do not uh, really help you to exchange the air. We're often dealing with older barns that do have some limitations, but we can often make modifications to improve them. Things to think about are the orientation. Of course, uh, with an existing barn, you can't change that. Okay, when we think about orientation, 
uh, barns that are north south with wind from the uh, from the west and open to the east will uh, allow for pretty good ventilation, especially in a barn that's a two or three row barn. Oftentimes we look at building these barns basically east west open to the south that will provide us basically some warming sun in the winter time that are going to help us out there. So you need to kind of assess the whole situation. Think about the distance between other buildings and how that may be blocking ventilation. Think about sidewall heights. We'd like to see 14 foot if we can. Curtains can be manual or automatic. Ridge openings, two to three inches per 10 foot of building width with 12 inches minimum. Eve overhang to reduce sun exposure in the summer. Gable openings to uh, adjust in the winter and the summer. End wall openings, sliding doors versus overhead or roll up doors. Sliding doors, unless you take them right off, we're always going to block some air movement. And building width, the wider building is going to be more of a challenge. So anyway, a lot of things to think about as far as facilities. So Margaret, what, what are some other considerations in successfully transitioning our heifers to the milking string? Yeah, so calving heifers in with minimal health problems is our goal. Acclimation to new things and processes is one way to reduce stress as a heifer calving in for the first time is gonna be going through a lot of physiological and social changes all at one time. She might be exposed to a new facility, new sound, smells, a new diet, and also new herd mates. She also have increased contact with humans and new experiences like going through the holding area in the parlor, through the parlor itself, or maybe possibly through a robot box. Speaking about robots, some farms with numerous robots have had success allowing heifers to access the robot for feed and to get used to the noise and the motions several weeks before calving to help transition them into the milking string with as little stress as possible. On any farm, having milkers and cow pushers and other employees with a calm and patient demeanor is definitely helpful when working with these new heifers to get them going and milking well. Just like with any animal, making sure that their first experience with a new task is a good one, and it makes for a smooth transition for both the cow and the worker. We've reached the end of this episode, and remember that our heifers are the future of our herd. With the ideas presented in this episode, along with Cornell resources, you can move closer to helping your heifers reach their genetic potential. Make sure to check out our other episodes of the Cornell Cooperative Extension, dialing in your best dairy. Thanks. This podcast has been presented by Regional Dairy Educators with Cornell Cooperative Extension and ProDairy.